oral questions. Question oral, the Honorable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, right now on this spring day in May, Canadians are still locked up, watching our American neighbours sit on patios with friends, play in parks with their kids, and cheer on sports teams in packed stadiums. Here in Canada, basketball hoops and swings are covered in plastic to keep the kids away, restaurants and patios still closed, and families can't see each other. Why? Because this government has failed to get vaccines. Isn't it true that we are far, far behind most other countries and Canadians are paying a heavy price for Liberal failures? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is working closely with provinces and territories to get Canada vaccinated as quickly as possible. To date, we have sent over 20.2 million vaccines to provinces and territories, with millions more arriving in the weeks to come. And let me remind the member opposite that the budget bill includes $1 billion to support provinces and territories in their vaccination efforts. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, Canadians are suffering while the rest of the world moves ahead, and it's because of the Liberals' third wave. Mr. Speaker, we all know the Liberal Thought Police are alive and well, and through C-10, the Prime Minister is expanding his attempt at controlling Canadians by controlling what they can see or can't see online. And if you question C-10, they'll call you a conspiracy theorist, all the while, the Heritage Minister has incoherent and inconsistent answers on how their own bill will apply. Do these Liberals have such a low opinion of Canadians that they think they must control their online activities? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has the highest opinion of Canadians, and let me say I believe every single member of this House does too. All of us are privileged to serve our Canadian constituents. Now, as a former journalist and editor, let me assure Canadians that our government understands how essential freedom of expression is to democracy. We will never limit freedom of expression. This bill does not do that. Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Well, yesterday the Minister of Heritage admitted the goal of C-10 is to end net neutrality, thereby, thereby controlling online freedoms. This isn't about web giants or artists. It's about what Canadians can and can't post and can and cannot see online. Can the Heritage Minister just admit that what these Liberals are trying to do actually has nothing to do with promoting Canadian content and everything to do with stifling free speech and expression? Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me just say, speaking very personally, as a former journalist and editor, I absolutely understand how important freedom of expression is. It is a foundation and pillar of our democracy. And I want to assure all members of this House and all Canadians that our government will never limit freedom of expression. That is not what this bill does, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, we Conservatives are in favour of culture and against censorship. The problem with C-10, Mr. Speaker, is that it was literally put together by the Heritage Minister uh, haphazardly and freedom of expression is no longer protected. It's even threatened. We're not the only ones saying that, Mr. Speaker. Academics, former CRTC members and other observers are all saying this bill goes too far. The minister himself says that those who have a popular YouTube account will come under federal jurisdiction. Who's going to draw the line between what's good and what's bad? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, our government has been, is completely against censorship, and I think all members in the House feel the same way. We're all against censorship. But, Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect us to be there to support our artists and creators, and that's why our government has been very happy to see a unanimous resolution from the Quebec National Assembly in support of Bill C-10. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that the Deputy Prime Minister feels that way. 
because every time the heritage minister speaks, he sticks his foot in his mouth on the weekend. Within 24 hours, he had to clarify his remarks twice, apology, and now his parliamentary secretary is the one doing the press conferences. The minister is the architect of this problem with C-10. And the question is simple, why did the minister remove the clause that protected freedom of expression, the honorable minister? Mr. Speaker, as a former journalist and editor, I'd like to assure you that I'm keenly aware that Canadians have the right to freedom of expression. Our government would never limit freedom of expression. That is not what this bill does. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is an important day for Quebec. It's an important day for French. The government of Quebec has just tabled Bill 96, the official languages and common language of Quebec Act, i.e. French. This is the most ambitious legislation since Bill 101. The Bloc Québécois salutes the determination to halt the decline of our common language and to promote its development. Does the Prime Minister agree and commend the Government of Quebec on this initiative to defend our only official language, our only common language, French? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've always said, the protection and promotion of French is a priority for our government. The federal government has recognized for the first time that the situation of French in Quebec is unique and that the government has a responsibility to protect and promote French. We are aware of the legislation tabled in Quebec City and we will study it closely. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Mr. Speaker, I was expecting more enthusiasm. The Bloc Québécois has solved a number of problems that Ottawa couldn't or wouldn't. Quebec has done what all federal governments have done since the failure of Meech Lake. They've written into the Constitution that Quebecers are a nation, a French-speaking nation, what's more. This is a strong assertion of our national will. I would invite the Prime Minister to make an official commitment, an unequivocal and categorical commitment. Will he undertake not to challenge, directly or indirectly, Bill 96 on the official and common language of French, which is French? Will he undertake not to challenge that legislation in court? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Excuse me, Mr. Speaker, I had some problems with my mute. Mr. Speaker, the protection and promotion of French is a priority to our government. Our government has, for the first time, recognized that the situation of French in Canada is unique and that the federal government has a responsibility to protect and promote French. That is a responsibility that we take very seriously and it will be a pleasure for us to work with all members to do just that. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. There's currently a ban on the donation of blood from gay men, a blood ban which makes absolutely no sense and has no basis in science. And the Liberals know this. They've campaigned to remove the blood ban in 2015 and in 2019, yet continue to break that promise. And now I have a question directly for the Prime Minister. Why does the Prime Minister continue to campaign to remove the blood ban, yet right now is defending the blood ban in court? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to thank the member opposite for this very important question. Uh, speaking as a member of parliament, it is something that I have spoken to many, many of my constituents about and that I know gravely concerns many Canadians. Our government absolutely shares those concerns. At the same time, we respect the independence of Canadian institutions, especially when it comes to medical and scientific issues. Well, member for Burnaby South. Ça n'a pas aucune sens. That makes no sense. In the during the election campaign, they said they were opposed to this ban, which is based on no science whatsoever, and it is injurious and offensive to gay men. That's clear, and the Liberals know it. And they even pledged to fight against this ban. Why has the Prime Minister campaigned to get rid of this ban, but currently uh, hasn't uh, delivered the goods, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to point out that our government agrees that this is a discriminatory practice that uh, upsets many Canadians, offends them. Our government is working very hard now to get rid of this practice, but we have to work cooperatively with our medical and scientific experts. Number four, Abbotsford. Well, the Prime Minister promised a growth budget. Instead, all he gave us was bigger government, bigger debt, bigger deficits. More and more experts are piling on. Kevin Lynch, the former Deputy Finance Minister, said that the budget missed an urgent opportunity to rebuild our longer-term growth post-pandemic. He said that this intergenerational transfer of debt and risk was unprecedented. By any measure, the biggest spending budget in our history was a bust. Why did the Prime Minister miss this opportunity to secure our economic future? Full Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am so glad to get this question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about how well the Canadian economy is doing. And let me talk about some verdicts that really matter. Standard & Poor, the International Ratings Agency, one week after the budget reaffirmed our triple A rating and said the outlook for Canada is stable. Mr. Speaker, it doesn't get better than that, and that should assure all Canadians. Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, last month, Canada lost 200,000 jobs. The recent budget wasn't about economic growth. It was about an avalanche of spending to re-elect the Prime Minister. Now we read troubling reports about officials who were asked to come up with excuses for million dollars of, of spending after that spending had already been announced. Go figure. Turns out this budget wasn't about growth. It was about a ready-fire-aim approach to policymaking that isn't about serving Canadians. It's about serving this Prime Minister. And who's left holding the bag? Canadians, of course. The Prime Minister has failed us. Why? Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives may have their own partisan reasons for talking down the Canadian economy, but I am so proud of how resilient and innovative Canadians are. And Mr. Speaker, that resilience is showing in the numbers. In the fourth quarter, Mr. Speaker, our economy grew by 10%. In the first quarter of this year, Mr. Speaker, it grew by 6.5%. And Mr. Speaker, in the first quarter, the US grew up by only 6.3%. And Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada has upgraded its forecast for this year to 6.5% growth. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lérable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thousands of small businesses have had to close their doors because they couldn't get help during the pandemic. But this Prime Minister sent a billion dollars in wage subsidies to large companies that didn't need it and paid millions in dividends to their executives. Extend to Care, Canada's largest privately owned seniors residence operator, applied for and got $21 million in wage subsidies, claiming that demand for care was declining during the pandemic. Why did the Prime Minister choose the Liberal elite over working Canadians? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. 
our government always chooses to support Canadians and Quebecers. That's precisely what we did. The wage subsidy supported 5.3 million workers in Canada, and in Quebec alone, the wage subsidy supported 1.29 million workers. It's very important to support Canadians today, Mr. Speaker, and that's precisely what our government is going to do. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Clérable. The finance minister should know that the reality is that the rich got richer during the pandemic at the expense of struggling Canadians. That's the reality. Marcel Bourassa, CEO of Savaria, received $3.4 million in dividends, while his company received $4.5 million in wage subsidies. Alain Bedard, CEO of TFI International, paid $2.3 million in dividends to his execs, while his company received $25 million in public funds. Why did the President of the Treasury Board authorize these payments to the Prime Minister's rich cronies? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that our government was there for Canadians from the very start of the pandemic, and we will remain there for them. 8.73, uh, jobs received the wage subsidy from, uh, companies rather, received the wage subsidy. Our government has supported more than 10 million Canadian workers. We know that we need to support Canadians, and that's precisely what we're doing. For Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are now learning that at least 32 companies that filed for bankruptcy before the pandemic was declared took millions from the wage subsidy, but no jobs were protected despite the taxpayer investment. It's becoming more and more clear that the Liberal government failed to provide the necessary oversight on this program worth over $100 billion. Meanwhile, a woman entrepreneur in my riding opened a gym in early 2020 and doesn't qualify for any federal program as a result. And I wrote to the government two months ago about this and have yet to receive a response. So why is the Liberal government prioritizing bankrupt companies over new small business owners who've received nothing. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, that question, I'm afraid, betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of how bankruptcy protection works in Canada and what it is intended to do. Bankruptcy protection is intended to enable companies to restructure and to emerge as viable businesses. It is entirely appropriate for companies during that process to be encouraged to maintain employment. That is exactly what the wage subsidy does and continues to do. It has supported the jobs of 5.3 million Canadians. We're proud of that, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the if the Deputy Prime Minister is proud that her government funded Pender Fund Capital Management, which has $1.5 billion in assets, and one of its most prominent funds recorded ever was 40% of returns last year, or JM Fund Management, which had a pretty good return in 2020, not yet seen since 2016, and ranked one of the third best performing hedge funds in 2020. So I'm just wondering if she finds it ethical, or personally I find it a bit disrespectful, her response, particularly in light of all the small businesses that opened up right before the pandemic and received not a penny from this Liberal government. So again, I'm just wondering if the minister believes, like her predecessor, that it's ethical to give billions to wealthy hedge funds and bankrupt companies and nothing to newly open small businesses. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what I think is ethical is doing whatever it takes to support Canadians and Canadian businesses get through this once in a generation pandemic. And that is why I am so pleased that 873,000 small businesses across the country have been able to receive the CBA loan. In the members' own province of Manitoba, 22,603 small businesses have received the CBA loan. The wage subsidy in Manitoba alone has supported 175,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, Quebec has repeated its intention today to subject federally regulated businesses to Bill 101. This meets the unanimous 
desire of the National Assembly of Quebec and a call from all living premiers. Ottawa has always opposed this, but this fall, the government finally recognized that it needed to protect and promote French in Quebec. They also recognized the unique situation of French in North America in an ocean of Anglophones. Will the government therefore collaborate with Quebec in order to apply Bill 101 to federally regulated businesses? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from Montarville for his excellent question because, yes, indeed, our government's recognition of the need for the protection and promotion of French is historic, and we want to recognize the right to work and be served in French. And th this should apply in federally reg regulated in industries in Quebec and in other parts of Canada where numbers weren't. So we are following the situation closely with the new legislation in Quebec, and we will study that bill and, of course, protect language rights inherent language rights of Quebecers, both in Quebec and elsewhere in the country, while protecting language minorities. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, based on that recognition of the decline of French in Quebec and the need to promote and protect our language, it should be good news for the federal government to see Quebec tabling the most ambitious language reforms in 40 years. The government should undertake to be a partner with Quebec in applying Bill 96. Obviously, the first way of helping is not by not undermining this legislation. Will the government promise today that they will not challenge Bill 96, whether directly or financially? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you know, the government recognizes that Quebecers constitute a nation within Canada, and the official languages of Quebec, uh, language of Quebec is French. And I tabled a reform document earlier this session. Now, it goes without saying that we need to play our role to do our part as a government to protect French in Quebec and all across the country. Because, as my colleague said, it goes without saying that there has been a decline of French in Canada. So we need to act, and we will. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quebec has created a French language commissioner, not an official languages commissioner, because French has to be the common language in Quebec. Finally, Quebec will apply Bill 101 to federally regulated businesses. Finally, Quebec is asserting its place as a French-speaking nation before Canada. Will the federal government recognize that Quebec has to be the sole master of its house when it comes to language policy, and will they act as an ally rather than an adversary? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, I would remind my colleague that since the very beginning, uh, since we tabled our reform document and bef before the throne speech even, we recognized the unique situation of French in Quebec and in Canada. We will do more. The federal government believes that true equality between our two official languages is necessary, so we will be doing more to support Francophones' language rights in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada, and we will protect the rights of all language minorities, and I will have the opportunity to work with my Quebec counterparts in the months to come. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Speaker, it's becoming clear that scientists at the government's virus lab in Winnipeg worked closely with China. One of these scientists, Dr. Chu, not only visited China five times in two years for this work, but also collaborated with scientists at China's Military Institute and trained scientists at the Wuhan Institute of Virology to a level four standard, enabling them to handle the world's most deadly viruses. With all the known concerns about China's communist leadership, why was this government helping China build capacity to handle the world's most deadly viruses? Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite knows, first of all, that these particular researchers are no longer with the Public Health Agency of Canada, that I cannot comment due to privacy obligations, and that the National Microbiology Lab plays a critical role in research around the world and here in Canada. 
The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, in a democracy, citizens deserve answers. To work at this government's level for lab in Winnipeg requires a secret clearance, a clearance normally only given to Canadian citizens. CBC has reported that on July 5, 2019, doctors Chu and Cheng, along with Chinese students, were escorted from the lab by the RCMP. How on earth did Chinese nationals get secret clearance to work at the government's level four lab in Winnipeg, Manitoba? Full Minister. Mr. Speaker, first, let me talk about the important role the National Microbiology Lab plays and continues to play, especially in the context of a global pandemic, and thank the professionals there that are working day and night to help Canadians with the laboratory and research needs that we have. I will say that I can't comment on this matter due to privacy obligations. These people are no longer with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Well, member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, we live in a democracy where transparent and open government is incredibly important, something that this government is not upholding. We know that secret clearance requires senior level approval. We know that CSIS raised national security concerns about Dr. Chu, Dr. Cheng, and the Chinese students at the government's lab in Winnipeg, as the Globe and Mail has reported. Mr. Speaker, with all that we know about China's communist leadership, how were these individuals given secret clearance at the government's level four lab where the world's most dangerous viruses are handled? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it, I will just repeat, the National Microbiology Lab is a Canadian treasure and has been providing incredible research and laboratory support to Canadians and Canadian organizations around the country during the pandemic. And I will also remind the member opposite that these individuals are no longer with the Public Health Agency of Canada and that I cannot comment due to privacy uh, obligations. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Well, the Ethics Commissioner's report into the Wee scandal is a doozy. This is way beyond whether or not Bill Morneau should have recused himself. What we learned is that the Office of the Finance Minister of a G7 country used their enormous influence to open doors to further the private interests of the Kielbergers. I mean, they, Liberals were intervening right down to the municipal level to help their friend Craig. And then the Liberals put the Wee brothers in the driver's seat of a $900 million deal with no competition. That's what got them into trouble. When will this government end this blatant insider access for their cronies and their pals? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Commissioner has investigated the matter and the report released today clearly the Prime Minister of all allegations. Let me quote directly from the report on page three. Quote, the Prime Minister did not contravene subsection 6.1, section 7, or section 21 of the Act. The Commissioner is conclusive on page 40. Quote, I cannot conclude that a contravention has occurred. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, in the liberal ranks, there's really a culture of conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. We saw that today. This is the fifth time that the commissioner has announced that there's a conflict of interests among the liberals. Not one, not two, not three, five times. Even though the prime minister was not personally blamed, this affects the whole government because it was cabinet that took that decision. Will the Prime Minister commit today to ending this culture of nepotism and prioritizing the needs of Canadians and not his Bay Street friends? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the report published today by the Commissioner exonerates the Prime Minister of all the allegations. And on page three of the report, it says that the Prime Minister did not contravene sections 3.1 7 or 21 of the legislation and the commissioner additionally said that no evidence exists to show that the prime minister's decisions were taken in an irregular fashion in this manner in this matter and the report concludes there was no violation of the rules oh, Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, many Canadians, including myself, were pleased to see investments made through Budget 21 to restore the Law Reform Commission of Canada. 
In a world that has changed so much since 2006, when the Commission saw a cut in funding by the previous Conservative government, our justice system has faced new and more complex challenges. Now more than ever, we must ensure that Canadians have access to a justice system that is fair, relevant and accessible. Can the Minister tell us more about this very important investment? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for his question. Through Budget 2021, we will invest $18 million over five years and $4 million ongoing to revive the Law Commission so that it is able to continue its important work guiding the federal government on the legal challenges of today and tomorrow with evidence-based ideas and research. The Commission will also ensure, Mr. Speaker, that our justice system is responsive to challenges such as systemic racism in the justice system and will also help in establishing a new relationship with Indigenous peoples. Mr. Speaker, today I am paying homage to one of my mentors, late Law Commission President Rod McDonald, both in answering this question and in wearing this bow tie. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. The federal government approved an unprecedented four-month delay between doses of vaccine due to supply, meaning few Canadians are fully vaccinated against COVID. The federal government has not issued any clear advice for half-vaccinated Canadians about their level of protection, their risk of transmitting COVID, and what restrictions do or do not apply to them. Given the Prime Minister's announcement of a half-vaccinated summer, what official public health advice does the federal government have for half-vaccinated Canadians regarding what they can or cannot do? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not really sure where to start with that mixed bag of half-truths and and falsehoods, but I'll start with this, Mr. Speaker. Here's what we do know. Vaccines save lives and they stop the spread of COVID. They are a critical tool in getting our lives back to normal. I want to thank all of the immunizers across the country who are working so hard to get vaccines in Canadians' arms. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, we're doing a phenomenal job. We see that we are one of the fastest immunizers in the G7. We see Canadians stepping up in unprecedented ways to take vaccination when it's offered to them. And I would encourage Canadians to continue to get vaccinated. It will save their own life. It will help stop the spread in their community. And we will have a much better summer and fall. Before continuing, I just want to remind all the members in the chamber and for joining us virtually to be judicious on the language that they use. Sometimes some language may be inflammatory and cause problems. It's not necessarily a bold word that we think is going to be it, but sometimes the intentions behind it. So I just ask all members, I know this is uh, week five of a, of, a, of a long stretch, and uh, just uh, be mindful of uh, our uh, fellow members in the chamber. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. Thank you, Chair, for that advice to the Health Minister. Even though only 3% of Canadians are fully vaccinated, by now, Canadians should have advice from the federal government on what they can look forward to once fully vaccinated. And this also applies to half-vaccinated Canadians, given the proclamation of a half-vaccinated summer. Countries around the world are doing this. This type of hope will incent people to get the vaccines. So... What advice does the federal government have for half-vaccinated Canadians or fully vaccinated Canadians regarding what they can or cannot do? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me repeat. Vaccines save lives and they stop the spread of disease. And I think Canadians know that we need to get to the finish line together. Canadians have made extraordinary sacrifices for each other. And now they're stepping up to the plate, getting vaccinated when it's their turn. That's how we see a light at the end of this tunnel, Mr. Speaker. I am so proud of all the immunizers around the country who are working so hard to get immunization to Canadians no matter where they live. We're going to reach that finish line, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to get there together. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, we have learned that Quebec and Ontario have suspended the administration of the first dose of AstraZeneca and that four other provinces are considering the same thing. Canadians who have received a first dose of AstraZeneca are, are worried and they want answers. They want to know whether they can mix and match doses or do they need to start over and take two doses of another vaccine? Can we get a clear answer, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, Canadians' response has been guided by health and evidence and science, Mr. Speaker, and this is no different. We know that many provinces are pausing. 
the delivery of AstraZeneca, I will say this, it is important for Canadians to get vaccinated as soon as they are offered. This is how we save lives, how we stop the spread and how we get our lives back. And I am certain that uh, provinces will do their absolute best to make sure that no doses go unused. The Honourable Member for Charlevoix, Tachal. Is it really right that I am the one who has to ask the Minister of Health how this is going to work? And we shouldn't forget that from the beginning, the Prime Minister and the and the Minister of Health have contradicted Theresa Tam and, and Nassi. So I will ask my question again. If Canadians have received a first dose of AstraZeneca, can they mix and match? Should they get another AstraZeneca dose? Or do they need to start over and take two doses of another vaccine? Does the minister even know, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we see a pattern from the Conservative Party of politicians wanting to interfere with the work of scientists, regulators, and researchers. Mr. Speaker, I will tell you this. Every vaccine that is authorized for use in Canada is safe. Canadians are stepping up in unprecedented ways. I myself have been immunized with AstraZeneca. I look forward to getting a second dose as soon as I am eligible. Mr. Speaker, that's what Canadians are doing. They're stepping up to help each other and to help themselves and to stop the spread of COVID-19. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, the Quebec National Assembly unanimously adopted a motion on Quebec culture in the digital age. According to the motion, Bill C-10 doesn't go far enough when it comes to protecting Quebec culture from the web giants. And that is very true. And that is why the Bloc Québécois has brought forward amendments to meet the expectations of the Quebec cultural sector. And on Tuesday, the House leader warmly supported the motion. So does that mean that he will prioritize C-10 when it leaves committee according to the unanimous wish of the National Assembly and the Quebec cultural sector? The Honourable Minister, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, and I'd like to thank the National Assembly. I'd like to... I'm very pleased that it supports rapid adoption of Bill C-10. It's a very important piece of legislation. And it's very important for the Quebec cultural and artistic industry and, and for the rest of Canada as well. We will get it adopted as quickly as possible. And we hope that the work will go well at committee. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, the National Assembly's motion also asks for Quebec to have full authority on culture and communications. And we've heard that before, even from liberals. For example, Robert Bourassa asked for that in 1973. He referred to it as cultural sovereignty. Jean Charest asked for the same thing in 2008. The federal liberals don't seem to be there yet. But good news, the liberals, Quebec lieutenant, supported the motion on Twitter this week, which means that he thinks that Quebec should have power over cultural communications. So, Mr. Speaker, will that be done before the end of the current session? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honorable colleague for his question. What's important for us is to do everything in our power to support the cultural sector. Everywhere in the country, including in Quebec, Mr. Speaker, which has been severely affected by the pandemic, Bill C-10 will add hundreds of millions of additional dollars to our cultural ecosystem, including hundreds of millions of dollars in Quebec. All of that for Francophone artists and musicians in Quebec and elsewhere in the country. For Calgary, Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, on March 8th, I asked the Immigration Minister if there were any privacy breaches in IRCC or CBSC, to which he claimed there have not been any. In fact, there were 1,793 privacy breaches from 2020 until now. One of those breaches led to more than 30,000 individuals' information being improperly disclosed. The facts don't line up with the claim. Why should Canadians trust this government with their data? when they will not take cybersecurity seriously. Full Minister. Mr. Speaker, I said then, and I'll say again now, that we take privacy very seriously in this government. We have put in place the laws and policies that are necessary to protect Canadians' privacy, as well as all of our clients who use the immigration system. We also have in place protocols to ensure that we are being transparent with Canadians when there are breaches. We work closely with all of the authorities to ensure that there is accountability so that we can continue to have an immigration system that delivers the economic and prosperity that we need in the long run for Canadians. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, this is the most anti-small business government in Canadian history. Who can forget the draconian 2017 tax changes and the Prime Minister's claim that small businesses are just a tax dodge for the wealthy? Small businesses are drowning in debt. They're facing uncertain futures while the government dithers its way through the pandemic with slow vaccine deliveries and failure to make use of other important tools. Where is the plan for a safe, permanent reopening? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our priority from the very beginning is to support Canadian businesses and to support Canadian workers. Budget 2021 is the most small business friendly government, small business friendly budget in Canadian history. From decisive action to lowering credit card fees to historic support for digital and technical technological adoption, we're making ambitious and targeted investments to help get our businesses back on that road to recovery, to create jobs, and to ensure that there is inclusive growth. I agree. Businesses, small businesses are the backbone of our Canadian economy. We've been there for them. We will be there for our small businesses now and into the future. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Beauce. Mr. Speaker, after the failure of its single source contract, this Liberal plan uh, for testing foreign workers is continuing to be a failure. There are various switch health tests that are still lost or incomplete, and there's no way to get results. And now the new provider in Quebec, Diana Carrier, is asking businesses to bring their workers, which are quarantining in Montreal, so that they can get tested in person. Has the government developed a new mobile quarantine system that I'm not aware of? When will the government fix this mess? <laughs> Monsieur le Président, nous avons travaillé avec... Mr. Speaker, we have worked closely with other federal departments in order to speed up processes and simplify the arrival of foreign workers as much as possible. The Public Health Agency and Service Canada have been in regular contact with Switch Health, employers, and industry associations with the goal to fixate these problems. We take this very seriously, and we will continue to work closely with Switch Health the Honourable Member for Marc Aurel Fortin. Mr. Speaker, it is estimated that more than half of food supply is wasted in Canada each year, which means that we could avoid wasting more than $50 billion worth of food. Reducing waste would mean that we could increase food availability and it would lead to savings for businesses and consumers. It would create more robust food systems and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Could the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food tell us how our government is giving entrepreneurs the resources to create innovative solutions in order to fix this problem? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A few days ago, I was able to unveil the names of the 24 semi-finalists of the first Food Waste Reduction Challenge. Each organization will receive $100,000 and move to a second stage, which will involve piloting the solutions on the market. These projects are varied and innovative, and the goal is to reduce waste, for example, by processing imperfect produce or by avoiding landfilling thanks to new composting approaches. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Enbridge Line 5 has been consistently sanctioned as safe by the U.S. regulator. Now, the Governor of Michigan is trying to overrule that federal oversight authority. Enbridge is being pushed into U.S. court to defend the energy needs of Canadians and the 30,000 jobs in Ontario that depend on Line 5. This pipeline operates under an international agreement signed by our two nations. For the sake of Canada's energy security, will the Prime Minister step up and engage with the U.S. President on the enforcement of our treaty? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Line 5 is a critical energy and economic link between Canada and the U.S. Because of our efforts, it continues to operate today. On Tuesday, 
The government of Canada filed an amicus brief in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Michigan, sending a clear signal as to where Canada stands on this issue. I want to thank my counterparts, Minister Savage in Alberta, Minister Ayer in Saskatchewan, Minister Rickford in Ontario, and Minister Julien in Quebec for their collaboration and their unity on this issue. This is a full core press by Team Canada with the support of industry and labour. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Mr. Speaker, we've seen nothing but incompetence from this natural resource minister. Why do we have to wait for a U.S. mediator to tell us if and how long we can continue to use Line 5? On this file, the minister has done the very least he could and at the very last moment. Line 5 is the critical piece of energy infrastructure in Canada that supplies Western Canadian oil to Eastern refineries and creates good-paying jobs along the way. If the relationship has never been better between the U.S. and Canada, why doesn't the Prime Minister pick up the phone, call President Biden, and get the Line 5 issue resolved today? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I take exception to the Honourable Member's comments. First of all, we're taking the exact approach that the Canada UF Special Committee asked us to, the same approach that the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Quebec, and Ontario had urged us to. Canada has filed an amicus brief in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Michigan. It sends a clear signal as to where Canada stands on this issue. We are encouraged that Enbridge and the state of Michigan continue to participate in the court-ordered mediation process. We are confident it will yield a local solution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, this government's failure to secure our borders has yet another casualty. 14 months ago, the Canada-U.S. border was closed, land, sea, and air. While Canadian charter boats are moored at dock, American charter boats are being issued work permits by this government. There was a recent sting by the RCMP, but generally, enforcement of our sea border has been lax. When will the Minister of Public Safety pull these work permits permanently and start enforcing our sea borders? The Honourable uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and I appreciate the member's acknowledgement that, in fact, we did close our border with the United States 14 months ago, and we've imposed unprecedented restrictions on the movements of, of, of people and goods across that border while at the same time maintaining essential supply lines. Mr. Speaker, as the member acknowledged, there has been enforcement by the RCMP um, on to the issue that he raises, and we'll continue to do our job working very collaboratively, reciprocally with our, with our U.S. counterparts. Those measures, Mr. Speaker, are working to help keep Canadians safe while we work towards the successful vaccination of our population, and we'll continue to maintain those restrictions as long as they are necessary. Honourable Member for York Centre. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I've been discouraged by conservative politicians with no medical training or background at all promoting what can only be described as vaccine hesitancy. This is not how we overcome the challenges of COVID-19. Canadians have been clear. Each of us, along with family, loved ones, and neighbours, should ensure we get vaccinated when our time comes and should raise our questions with medical professionals. It protects us, those close to us, and our communities. And Mr. Speaker, we've seen the progress. We've seen the action plan, and the action plan is working. Can the minister provide an update on vaccine doses delivered to Canada and vaccinations? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from York Centre for her question and hard work. Here are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Over 50% of adult Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine. We have delivered 21.5 million doses to provinces and territories, and Canada stands among the top three countries in the G20 for daily vaccination rates. We will receive up to 50 48 to 50 million doses prior to the end of June and up to 100 million doses prior to the end of September. We're working together to get Canadians vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. The equity passed in 2018, but the final regulations of this act have yet to be implemented. Some women will have to wait more than a decade after this legislation passed to see pay equity. The Minister of Labour stripped workers of their rights with back-to-work legislation in a day, but is missing in action when it comes to defending women's rights to equal pay for equal value. Why is it when it comes to attacking workers' rights, they can do it in a day, but when it comes to defining women's rights, they ask for a decade? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we are the first government to anchor our economic growth in women's health, in women's safety, and women's labor force participation. We move forward with pay equity legislation. Despite the protests from the Conservative Party of Canada, we will continue to work to ensure that women have equal pay for work of equal value and are safe everywhere. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the increasing crisis in the Middle East is a danger to the region and beyond. We are hobbled when we limit our response to both sides must de-escalate. Yes, they must. But true peace will never be achieved if we keep ignoring that one side is the occupier, the other is occupied. This current crisis was provoked by actions of the Netanyahu government and other extreme elements within settler groups. Can Canada speak out clearly to defend the Palestinian people against illegal annexation, illegal settlements, and illegal forced evictions? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada remains gravely concerned by the continued expansion of settlements and by the demolitions and evictions, including, for the, including the ongoing cases of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan. These actions impact families and livelihoods and do not serve peace or international law. Unilateral actions that prejudice the outcome of direct negotiations and further jeopardize the prospects for a two-state solution must be avoided. We will always stand ready to support efforts for a two-state solution.